Hello everyone. Um, today I'm going to show, demonstrate an example question from plastic bending after I do a little remedial and afterwards I'll solve one example from indeterminate uh, beam deflection and then I'll also try and explain a few key concepts from uh, beam deflections. So uh, last week in the workshops um, I covered um, elastic bending and the elastic flexure formula which is sigma equal m y on i remember that y is not the distance to the centroidal axis okay it's the distance from the cent the neutral or the centroidal axis for elastic uh, centroidal axis to the edges of the cross-sectional solid all right and so um, Ideally, when we look at bending, we see that when you start applying this moment m star, and if m star is less than the yield moment, or the moment that will cause yielding, we see that there's a linear relation between the stresses that are occurring at the top edge and the bottom edge of the cross-sectional solid and the sigma values are less than the yield stress okay but then as you increase this moment m star that it's equal to the moment that's going to cause yielding then you get that the stresses at the edges will be equal to the yield stress okay and if you have a little if you look at this little diagram I've drawn here for the stress and strain relation you see that this point is actually the point or the boundary between the solid being elastic and plastic okay elastic means that there's no uh, deformation if you apply the stress it goes back to its original shape when you release the stress but when it becomes plastic it starts deforming okay if you apply a, a stress that is larger than the yielding stress or larger, then um, the deformation in the solid will not go back to its original orientation. Okay, you start having this little deformation. But then when you start applying a moment that's uh, equal, that's going to start yield or at the yield point, the entire cross section is still elastic. Elastic being uh, shaded green and plastic section being shaded yellow. All right. But then when we start applying a moment M star on our cross sectional solid, which is larger than the yielding moment, but less than the fully plastic moment. Okay. So we see that the cross sectional solid is having a stress that's uh, causing the solid to be partially plastic all right so this distance d on the solid is starting to become plastic it's starting to deform all right remember these diagrams are stress diagrams all right just like your shear force and bending moment diagrams these are stress diagrams that are acting across the cross sectional surface of the solid and um, and then we increase m star to a point where it's equal to the moment that's going to cause the entire cross section to be plastic, and we call that m p, or denote that m p, which is the fully plastic moment. So there's a there's a way of finding m p. Okay, so if you have a cross-sectional solid, this is the stress diagram. It's fully plastic. So it's going to be C multiplied by the lever arm L between the two forces. Stress blocks will have a um, resultant force T in tension and C in compression. Okay, and so it's equal to CL or TL. So for this stress block over here, if you do sum of forces equals zero, the um, the translational equilibrium, you'll get that your the 
tensile force is equal to the compressive force. And what that tells us is that A in compression is equal to the cross-sectional area in tension. That area is on the solid, okay? Another thing that will be uh, covered in this little remedial is the shape vector alpha. Now, alpha is not too important in 2400. It becomes quite important when we start uh, designing steel structures in third year course, CVN 3303. And in that course, uh, Zp is a given parameter for your prefabricated members. And we'll be using that in the calculations, in the design calculations. What Z denotes is the section modulus. And what the section modulus is, is the ratio of the second moment of area over Y, which is the distance of the edges or whichever part of the solid that you're interested with respect to the centroidal axis. All right? And it has dimensions of millimeters to the power of three. So this is our elastic flexural formula over here. It only applies for um, elastic um, elastic bending. Okay. So I'm going to start uh, solving one example question. It's a not to scale. Remember, this, this thing is called a flange, all right? And this little section is called a web. So we have a top flange, we have a bottom flange. I've covered this in my class, but then it's for the people who don't have the, didn't, didn't come to my class or who've never been um, assigned to my uh, workshops. So this is the dimension of the cross-sectional solid that we're going to study in this uh, question. We're also given the stress strain diagram. We don't know what the yield stress is, but we know that the, sorry, yield strain is, but we know that the yield stress is 250 megapascals. Right. And um, let's say this is a steel beam. So steel, mild steel has a Young's modulus of 2 to the power of 10 to the power of 5 megapascals. Alright. So in the first part of the question, we want to determine if the tension zone is plastic or partially plastic. Given that the top flinch is plastic in compression. And in part B, we want to locate the neutral axis. 
part C, we are asked to find the bending moment M. Okay, that bending moment is um, across this entire surface, entire cross section. It says that it's compression in the torque, so it should be counterclockwise. Okay, and um, the Part D wants us to find the curvature or kappa. And the last part of the question is asking us to find the residual stresses. So it's going to be quite a long example, tutorial example, so um, bear with me. So part A, let's have a look at the area of the top flange. So the top flange is 100 millimeters in width, 20 millimeters in depth. So that's going to be 100 multiplied by 20, 2000 millimeters squared. So the bottom flange the width is 40 and the depth is 50. So it's going to be 40 multiplied by 50 it's also equal to 2000 millimeter square. So what we see is that the area of the top flange is equal to the area of the bottom flange. If the the moment that's acting across the entire solid is uniform. You've got the flanges having equal area. And so the force per unit area is going to be equal. So we have this relation that the, the compression and the tension in the flanges will be equal. Therefore, bottom flange has to be fully plastic. Okay. So that's part of the question. Part B wants us to locate the neutral axis. Now there's a difference between the neutral axis and a centroidal axis. The centroidal axis is what we've, it's a geometrical property, okay? Y bar is a geometrical property. It just tells us how um, the small little uh, dA, infinitesimal dA, uh, of the little uh, cross-sectional solids are distributed, all right? But what the neutral axis is, is it's a point or a line along the cross-section where the stresses are neither in, tem in tension or in compression, okay? It's, there's zero stress, all right? That's the, that's the little difference. It, it doesn't, the centroidal axis and the neutral axis um, coincide when the cross-sectional solid is elastic but when it becomes plastic, the neutral axis moves away. Okay. So with that being said, let's take the forces in the horizontal, the equilibrium condition for forces in the horizontal direction. What you get is that CF 
That's the uh, compression force in the web for CW. CF is the compression uh, force in the flange. is equal to the tension in the web and the flange. We've already uh, denoted that the flanges are going to have equal forces. And so, it's going to be that the tension and the compressive forces and the webs have to be equal. Let's draw the stress diagram for our solid. So, um, this is our solid. Neutral axis. We know that the, the moment is acting this way. We know that the, the flanges are plastic. Okay. And the flanges are the flange, sorry, the web is elastic. Okay. Mm. That's the yield stress. Plastic, plastic, that's 50, that's the depth of the bottom flange, 20 for the top flange. Okay, so that's C flange, C web. Okay. Let's call this distance X. So the distance of the web below the neutral axis is denoted as X millimeters. So if C web is equal to T web. The area, the cross sectional area of the solid that is in compression and tension for the web members has to be equal. And so for compression, we know that the entire web is 100 mils. So that's going to be 100 minus x mils that's in compression. And the thickness, sorry, not the thickness, the, the width of the web is 20 mils. So if you solve that, x comes out to be 50 mils. Okay? So, neutral axis is located x plus 50 mils. This 50 is for the depth of the bottom flange above the base. And this was 50, so it's going to be 100 mils. Okay.
So that's part B. We have to solve for the moment. And that moment is equal to CF. This is 50. 100 minus 50 is 50. And this little distance is going to be a half of 20. Okay, it's 50. So for the resultant force of a triangular prism, it's going to be two third of this entire distance, okay? Same for the bottom flange, 50 plus 50 on 2. Okay. So if you want to find the magnitude of T, the tension in the web, which is the same as the compression in the web. That's going to be the area of the stress block, a half time space, which is the yield stress multiplied by the height of the triangle, which is 50, multiplied by the width of the cross sectional solid. So the web has a thickness or a width of uh, 20 mils, so that's 20. Okay. This is two fifty. That's given. So for the flanges, it's just uh, rectangular blocks. So it's going to be the yield stress multiplied by the area of the flange. Which is 250. We found the area of the flange before. It's a thousand millimeter squared. So that's 250 kilonewtons. Sorry, it's 2000. So it's going to be 500 kilonewtons. So if you plug all these values in, you'll get a moment bending moment of seventy five point eight three kilonewton meters. Okay. Part D of the question wants us to find the curvature. Kappa is equal to the yield strain. over the height, okay, the, the vertical distance, y. Yield strain is the yield stress divided by the Young's modulus. This uh, vertical distance would be 50. So solve that, you'll get 2.5 times 10 to a negative 5 per millimeters, right? So the last part of the question wants us to find residu residual stresses. So these, these residual stresses they develop So we have a plastic moment on, that's developing in the, 
and the cross-sectional solid are being applied, we remove it. When we remove the moment, the plastic moment, you you still have residual stresses in the in the cross-sectional solid, and they're important for fatigue when considering fatigue of materials or of connections, okay, and other mechanical behaviors. So if you want to find residual stresses, you need to um, you need to assume that the the top and bottom flange or the top and bottom edges of the solid is actually plastic. We've done that in um, the part A of the question. Well, it's actually given that the top half is, um, is uh, it's plastic. And so um, we need to find the centroidal axis now. done this in the first few weeks of um, our workshop demonstrations I think you all would be very you should be fairly confident by now in calculating this not going to do it and you also need to find your second moment of area so you use your parallel axis theorem find it for each each solid partition it and then the you get a second moment of area having a magnitude of 10 to the power of 7 millimeters to the power of 4 okay so once we remove the plastic moment it's the section is going to be elastic and for elastic, uh, for elastic uh, solids, we know that the centroidal axis and the neutral axis coincide. Okay, so this is going to be our neutral axis when uh, the plastic moment is removed, and we have an elastic section. So because it's now elastic, we can now use the elastic flexure formula. Remember, I've introduced the negative sign over here, particularly because I'm interested in the sign conventions for my stresses, okay? So if you were in my workshop demonstration, tensile stresses are positive, compressive stresses are negative, counterclockwise moments positive, um, clockwise would be negative. This distance y is from measured from the neutral axis. I've stressed that in my class as well. So if you, have a, if you have a solid, this is the neutral axis. If you go up, it's going to be positive. If it's below the neutral axis, it's negative. All right? And so this time we're going to apply this moment. But it's going to be a clockwise. Okay, we're going to apply this, this plastic moment that we found in part C, but then we're going to apply it clockwise. Okay, so it now becomes a partially plastic moment. It's not a plastic moment anymore. All right. And so let's have a look at the top edge. Our moment is clockwise, so it's negative. The top, the distance of the top edge from the neutral axis is still positive. Remember, the neutral axis is now uh, coinciding with the centroidal axis because it's a, uh, it's partially plastic or it's still elastic. Okay. The second moment of area, it's always positive. So plug that in, you'll get a moment of, uh, sorry, a stress of two seventy eight megapascals. Positive, so it's tensor. Let's have a look at the bottom flange. So 
So that's going to be negative 95 because it's below the neutral axis. You get a negative uh, stress. So it's in compression. Okay. So if we want to draw our residual stress diagram, So this was in part C of the question, and the moment was actually acting this way. Okay. When we calculate, when we reverse the moment, and when we're trying to find the elastic stresses, got that the bottom half is in compression the maximum magnitude at the edge being 352 megapascals top edge is 278 megapascals so the residual stress is going to be the sum of these two stress diagrams or stress blocks so it's going to be 278 minus 250 that's 28 megapascals in tension and at this point I'm not sure okay um, basically um, these these stresses are for the base the bottom So these stresses are actually at this point and this point of our cross-sectional solid. I'm not sure if this uh, residual stress diagram is correct because um, I seem to have this going to zero with 102 in my little calculation sheet over here. What I'll do is I'll, I'll draw this correctly and I'll put it in the comment section of my YouTube video. And um, bear in mind that please feel free to comment under the video and I'll try and 
answer these questions. You can also do that on the workshop forum, but it's fine. But if you're referring to, if you have questions with regards to this workshop demo that I'm showing on YouTube, just ask me in the comment section. It's easier for me to reply there rather than on Moodle. All right, so that's the quest, uh, demonstration question for plastic bending. Let's move on to uh, beam deflections. So what beam deflections are is that when you have a little cantilevered beam as shown in the structure, and you have this apply, applied force F, this beam will bend in this way. That's not deflection, that's bending. And when it bends in that way, there's a, there's a distance that the original position of this edge has moved down, and that distance is deflection. Okay, it's lowercase v, capital V is for shear. So yeah, and uh, we've introduced in the lectures the relation between deflection and internal moment is that the internal moment is equal to the cross-sectional property, the EI of the material, multiplied by the second derivative of deflection. Okay, so if we want to find deflection, it'll be integrating m over EI twice. And because we're integrating, because it's an indefinite integral, we'll have integration constants. So we still need to find these integration constants. So what we have is we start using these limiting conditions or what are called boundary conditions. So let's have a look at this pin or roller support. So when this beam deflects or bends, we see that the deflection at point zero, the origin, is zero. There's no deflection at the support. Okay? Same for rollers and pins. So when we have a cantilevered structure, when the beam deflects, you see that the deflection at this point, the connection point with the wall, is actually zero, and there's no bending, there's no slope in this little bit, in this tiny bit. It's a uh, flat. So the slope at the origin is also zero. So these are the boundary conditions that you need to be aware of. And we're going to be using that. Okay. So when we have a beam, we'll have all sorts of applied loads. It can be moments, it can be point forces, or it can be distributed loads like this. And remember when you write your MX, it has to apply or be representative of the entire beam. Okay, so if you take a cross section here, you can't write an equation for MX because that MX equation is not going to be representative of the entire beam. So you have to take a cut over here. Okay. But then how do I switch on my UDL? And to switch it on, we're going to use a little trick from Matt. And that's called step functions. So basically what step functions does is that it turns the function on at a particular point. Okay? So if it's x minus a with these little inequality brackets, then you have that it turns on itself when x is larger than or equal to a. Remember it's a close. Okay, it's an open. And before that, it doesn't turn, to turn itself on. It's just zero. All right? So step functions will be really useful to turn on. But what we know about UDLs is that it can be applied in any way. Okay? And so step functions only turns on. It doesn't switch off. There's no way you can switch it off. And so if you were to write a an internal moment equation in terms of x for this entire beam, if you, 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 you cannot write something that's also going to be um, representative if you take a cut over here for the entire beam. Okay? So, if we, so what we do is that we keep the UDL running till the end of the beam. And because this new bit that we apply, the new deal on the new bit, is non-existent in our original structure or in reality, we have to introduce another uniformly distributed load to counter 
the new UDO that we've introduced. And this is where we use our ingenuity. Okay? And so if we, if we write an equation for the internal moment mx by taking cross-section here, cut here, it's going to be representative for the entire beam. Because this bit can be actually turned on at this distance. Okay, let's call that A, so it can be turned on at x minus A. What I want you to do for practice is try writing an equation for the internal moment mx for this scenario and this scenario. Remember, it can only be switched off. It doesn't, it just increases, right? This one, so we have a triangular UDO and it's actually decreasing as you go this side. So you need to come up with your ingenuity by applying certain UDOs. And I want you to do that for practice, okay? I may or may not give you the solution to this in the next YouTube video. I'm still thinking because not a lot of you have access to these videos and I, I don't think it's going to be fair given that indeterminate um, beams is going to be part of your exam. All right. Okay, so that's my introduction to beam deflections. I'm going to solve an example. So it's uh, it's indeterminate. If you can solve an indeterminate structure, you can solve a determinate structure quite uh, trivially. It's not it's not hard. Let's say you have omega it's a b c. Two L, that's L. It's not to scale though. So the reaction forces would be A Y, B Y, C Y. You know that there's no horizontal external forces acting on our beam, so you're not going to have the reaction forces in the horizontal direction. So you can just ignore them. All right. So from our static equilibrium equations. Okay, that's equation number one. So the second equation that we have from equilibrium is rotational equilibrium. You can take this moment either about the pivotal points A, B or C, but I think it's easier to take a moment about C. You do that, it's going to be we're going to have a little step function Sorry, copied the wrong. By multiplied by L. Okay, so this um, A is actually going clockwise. So it's going negative A, 3L, negative B, Y because it's clockwise. So what we have that's the second equation. Okay, we can't solve them because we've got three unknowns. We only have two equations. Let's um, write an equation for the internal moment mx. So for this, taking a cross-sectional cut here would be representative of the entire beam. Okay. So
That's x. That's 2L. Sum of moments about our cross sectional cut. You have reaction forces AY, BY, we're going to use a step function now, okay, that's for this distance over here. So our mx is equal to ayx by x minus 2l minus omega on 2 x minus 2l squared. So we know that the Young's modulus multiplied by the second moment of area multiplied by the second derivative of our deflection is equal to the internal moment mx. Okay, so let's integrate it once. Um, two, three is a six plus our integration constant, okay? So the second integral will give us our deflection to the power of three, two times three, six. Uh, 3 plus 1 is 4 to the power of 4. 4 times 6 is 24. The original integration constant will be multiplied with a power of x. We have a new integration constant. Okay? So we need to determine what the values of C1 and C2 are. So we'll introduce boundary conditions. Okay? So what we have is a beam that's simply supported by pins and rollers at points A, B, and C. Now we know that the deflection at these points has to be zero. That's the boundary condition. Remember this x is starting from the left end, okay? This is for A. I was hoping that my mom doesn't call. She's worried. I'll call her back after this video. So if you solve this, you'll get that C2 is equal to 0. And you'll get that C1 is equal to negative 2 times the reaction at A. L squared cubed. And the third equation will give you that and this is the third equation that we need to use to find our reaction forces. So there's different ways of solving this. One would be Gaussian elimination, the other would be just uh, substituting the what the to get one equation which is the relations between the different unknowns use whichever one you're comfortable with just make sure that you get the right answer it's really tricky okay so you do need to practice these questions so if you use Gaussian elimination you'll get that the reaction force at A which is what we are we're after is equal to 48 Oh, I forgot to specify what we're looking for in this question. In this question, we want to know what AY is, 
and we want to know the slope at A. Okay, that's what we're after. Sorry. Um, so we've got our AY, it becomes, it's negative, so it's actually going downwards. Okay, because we assume positive initially. So if we want the slope at A, it's going to be the first derivative of our deflection. That's equal to C1. You plug in that value that we've just found for A in there. What's your phi? Is that it's equal to omega L cubed over 72. A very universal uh, value or um, f that you'll be using in structural dynamics and in, um, in uh, design courses that you'll do later. So dv dx slope at a is equal to omega L cubed 72e. So that's it for this week's demonstration. Thank you so much. Um, I hope you enjoy uh, watching these uh, workshop um, examples. And if you have any questions with regards to these, please put it in the comment section. It's easier for me to reply there. Because if you, if you, if you talk about this on the workshop forum, then I'll, um, it's also okay, but then um, it's not fair for the people who kind of don't have the link. But then I really want all of you to have the link. I've been trying to give to as many people as possible. But then, yeah. Um, thank you. That's it for this week.